From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and your family are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. 85% of global commerce, 75% of oil and gas, and 93% of all data comes across or from the world's oceans, which doubles as a weather vane for our planet. This sea-based globalization is straining against just-in-time supply chain limitations. And many people are asking, is there a maritime global arms race starting up right now? To answer that question, our guest today is a PhD in foreign policy programs at the Brookings Institute and a consulting professor at Stanford and author of the fascinating book, To Rule the Waves, Bruce Jones, PhD. Bruce, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor and it's a pleasure. And I have to say it's a, a distinct pleasure to speak to an audience which has such a long standing and, and prestigious connection to questions of maritime power and maritime prowess, um, uh, which is what I've been writing about over the last little while. So I'm, I'm delighted to talk to you all. I'm sorry that it's not in, in person, but I suspect we're reaching some more folks around the world by virtue of being of being virtual. I spent my entire life uh, beside one ocean or another and sailing and as a member of yacht clubs around the world, but I've not been a scholar of maritime issues until recently where I found myself tracking global trade issues. I was doing some work in the Arctic uh, and watching these changing dynamics of great power relations, especially between the United States and China. And what I found is that I was constantly, my gaze was constantly being pulled to the oceans. And I decided to write a book to try to understand and explain the way in which um, globalization, geopolitics, global energy flows, global climate change have all been shaped by dynamics on the world's oceans. Uh, I think probably many of your members can look out of their windows and see large stacks of container ships lined up, uh, backed up from the port of Los Angeles. We'll come to what, what that's all about. But it is a striking phenomenon that huge parts of our security, our environments, and our economy are shaped by competition in the world's oceans. And that's what I wrote about in this book, To Rule the Waves. I started by looking at the history of this and I was really struck to realize that for the past 500 years, no state, no nation, no empire has managed to climb the heights of global power to be the world's dominant power without simultaneously fueling the world's most powerful navy. And it goes back to this very ironic moment in history when the Portuguese, for this Western country in Europe, ironically, you have to go farther west into the Atlantic to catch the, the trade winds to sail around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean. But the, the Portuguese find the sea route into Asia at precisely the moment that what was then really the world's most important maritime power, which was China, decided to pull back from the seas. A whole series of internal reasons for that, uh, not, not occasioned by the arrival of the Portuguese happened before the arrival of the Portuguese. But it means that the Europeans arrive in Asia at a time when the major Asian players have withdrawn from the seas and Europe is able to project power across Asia. And for the next 500 years, European powers and then the United States dominate global politics and these kind of uh, huge lacuna in international affairs open up as the dominant Asian powers of the day recede under pressure from European navies. Most importantly, of course, the British Navy, which for 200 years rules the waves uh, and is able to use that power to enter the Indian uh, polity uh, and then eventually China through the Opium Wars. Much of what we think of today as the patterns of globalization can be traced back to that initial encounter uh, between Britain and the major European, uh, major and Asian empires of the day. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the articles of commitment of the World Trade Organization. I don't recommend you do. They're very boring, uh, but I did. And they contain important clauses, which are word for word uh, taken from the treaties which ended the Opium Wars in the 1850s, when the British Navy sort of forced its way into China to finance the later phases of the, of the British Empire. 
Uh, so hugely consequential maritime power in the history of empires. That, of course, lasted up into the Second World War, in which, you know, at the end of which we took over as the dominant navy in the world. I would say that it is the case that during the Cold War, although the Navy was important, obviously nuclear submarines were important to the survivability of our nuclear stockpile, naval issues receded somewhat because we had this very unusual experience of the United States being a land power in Europe and a land power in Asia. The forward deployment of large quantities of American power changed the dynamics and we didn't have to use our Navy to project power out to, uh, out to Asia and Europe. Um, and so naval issues sort of receded somewhat. And the, the front lines of our competition with the Soviet Union wasn't the Mid-Atlantic, it was Eastern Europe. Uh, and nuclear weapons were, of course, a dominant concern. So during the Cold War, naval matters receded somewhat from the kind of heights of our, our strategic debate. In a different domain, the oceans were about to matter a great deal more, and that's in trade. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of graphics that illustrate what I'm around about to talk about. If you go back to the 1950s and you look at world trade, you'll see that it was largely a function of flows between Latin America and the United States on the one hand, and Africa and Europe on the other. This is essentially flows of raw materials and agricultural goods, very little trade between Europe and the United States and very little trade across to Asia. Bruce, this is such a fascinating chart. What's the year? The this, is, uh, this is 1953, I think it is, from the CIA. And it's only some portions of trade, but you, you can take any function of trade and it, it replicates these exact patterns. Huh. But fast forward to the present day. That's global trade today. Those are shipping lines, uh, bulk shipping, oil containers, gas containers, and container ships. And you see that the trade patterns simply crisscross the globe. That's all shipping uh, in the world as, a, as of about October. And again, you see just every coastline, every trade route. Now, what is this? What are these? These are tankers? These are, these are container ships, tankers, bulk carriers, uh, and uh, yeah, those, those three. And the color would indicate what they are, whether they're a container or, or a tanker or what? Correct, yeah. Okay. It's a little bit distortive to see it as quite as, you know, if we go back to this one, it looks like every part of the world is covered by global trade. That's true. But if you organize by value, this is what it looks like. And what you see is that you've got these incredibly strong lines across the Atlantic between the United States and Europe and across those two markets and out through the Suez and the Malacca Straits into Asia. And those are the two sort of dominant forms of trade. Interestingly, before this talk, I was wondering and was prepared to ask you how the traffic through the Suez compared to the Panama canals. Looking at this graphic, the Suez traffic is really, really, really bigger than I imagined it was. Look at the Panama Canal and look at the Suez. I don't know how to quantify it better than that, but the dark red yeah. indication through the Suez is pretty dramatic. And you don't see it super well, but it's even more dramatic through the Malacca Strait, um, which about 50% of all world trade passes through the Malacca Strait and up into the South China Sea. And we're going to come back to that with some maps a little bit a little bit later on, um, but that's that's trade by value. Now this comes about because you know the difference between this and this comes about because of a a minor change, which becomes a revolution, and it's a change that starts in Newark, New Jersey, um, with an American entrepreneur who uh, gets frustrated as a shipping magnate, uh, I'm sorry, a trucking on entrepreneur, and he gets frustrated by the uh, delays that he finds in, uh, in getting his goods off his trucks and on his ships, and they sit on dockyards for a long time. We're watching this, of course, in LA Long Beach right now, but he gets really frustrated by this, and he says, well, what if I just drive my trucks onto the ship? And he does. He drives three trucks onto the ship and sails it up to Baltimore. But then he realizes, okay, but now I can't use my trucks when they're on the ship. So he retrofits this and what he does is he backs up his trucks and he takes the containers off the back and he puts them on the ship, sails them up, drive his trucks and meets the containers. And containerization then begins to take over slowly at first, but it begins to take over the dynamics of trade. And Mark Levinson, an economist who wrote the first major book about this charts this evolution where um, uh, McLean, who, who this, this entrepreneur who did this innovation, 
he retrofits a ship to be able to do this full time, and it can contain 56 containers. <laughs> That's a quaint number, 56. And then, you know, it grows and he gets another one and it can take 127 containers and it grows and it grows and grows. And when Mark is writing this book in the 1980s, he's astonished by the scale of, of the growth. And at that stage, the largest container ship in the world holds 4,000 containers. Okay. <laughs> Um, writing the book, I sailed on the Madrid Maersk from uh, Singapore up to Shanghai. That ship has 20,526 containers. Okay. And I can do another little screen share and show you me on the prow of, of the Madrid Maersk. Uh, you scan out a little bit and you scan out a little bit further and you see the size of this thing. Um, I think in shipping, we're used to, at least in strategic world, we're used to thinking of aircraft carriers as giant ships. Uh, the largest aircraft carrier in the world is the USS Nimitz. You could take two of the USS Nimitz and drop it down into the space occupied by the Maersk Madrid and have room left over for the Empire State Building. Okay. <laughs> That's the scale uh, of global shipping. So we can see here in this graphic, uh, the gray is the USS Nimitz, the largest aircraft carrier in the world. And there's some nice little uh, visuals, a London bus, a blue whale, a Boeing 747, Nelson's column. And in the background, we see um, it was actually a CMA ship. It's not even the largest ship in the world. Uh, the one I sailed was a little larger than this. And when I was sailing that ship, 20,000 TEU carrier, there was a lot of gossip on the bridge about the, the idea that somebody was going to launch a 24,000 TEU ship. And they all thought, no, that can't be done. And of course, it was done shortly after I was on my on my voyage. So th these things are just of an enormous scale. And what we see is in the 60s and the 70s, these ships are moving across the Atlantic with 4,000 containers or so. And then it begins to open up with the, um, the Korean War and the Vietnam War. The army needs to get tons of material over to Asia and they adopt uh, the same container technology and create container facilities in, in ports in Asia. And that becomes the vehicle by which the Asian tigers of the 80s and the 90s sort of enter globalization and begin to grow at the scale that they did, Korea, Japan, Singapore, and very consequentially, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the earliest ports in Asia to adopt containerization and rapidly grows. And in the book, I spend a lot of time with the main family uh, that was responsible for that evolution, the Tongs uh, family out of Shanghai who moved to Hong Kong to escape the communist takeover of China and end up owning the largest shipping company in Asia and really driving the containerization of Hong Kong, which emerges as the first of the second largest container port in the world by the 19 by the 1990s. So very consequentially, Hong Kong uh, grows in scale, becomes one of the largest container ports in the world. And in, and in the book, I spent a lot of time with the family that was responsible for that. The Tungs uh, out of Shanghai uh, fled China after the communist takeover, moved to Hong Kong, became heavily involved in the containerization of the port of Hong Kong, and ended up owning the largest shipping company in, in Asia. That's consequential because shortly after that development, a very important change in world affairs happens, two of them. Hong Kong reverts to China and the United States normalizes with China. And those two things together lay the foundation for China to enter globalization. Now, um, if you go back to the 1960s, the 1970s, and you look at the list of the largest ports in the world, New York is the largest port in the world by a good measure, followed by London, Rotterdam, they're all Western ports. Uh, Japan is the only non-European or American country that has a, a port in the top 10. Then you see Korea and, uh, and Singapore joining the ranks, and then Hong Kong coming into play. Fast forward through the 2000s and the 2010s, and it's really remarkable to see the change. Uh, and in that early phase, suddenly Shanghai blips up and it's in the top 10. And then it just rises and rises and rises and rises inexorably. And it's a period of time when China is growing, growing at an extraordinarily fast pace, but you can see it measured in the volume of container trade through Chinese ports. So we're all watching the, we've been watching these backlogs at LA Long Beach, which is the largest port in the West, okay? LA Long Beach does 8 million container drops a year. Shanghai does 42 million container drops a year, right? And the next five largest ports in the world are all Chinese. 
And it's just a, a data point that shows you quite how large a role China has begun to play in global trade. And this kind of extraordinary explosion of sea-based trade is really what enabled China's entry into globalization. And you see it in this just inexorable growth of the Chinese ports through this period. I spent some time uh, at um, uh, the, the container port south of Shanghai, an astonishing facility, largely on reclaimed land, one large bay of which operates without human beings. It's all robotics and AI, extraordinarily sophisticated operation. Uh, but again, just a kind of a data point that illustrates the huge scale in global trade that, that China has come to play. And containerization and bulk shipping really made that possible because what containerization and bulk shipping has done is essentially to erase distance as a cost factor in transportation. In, in manufacturing and in sales, okay? So if you create a T-shirt someplace in Vietnam or Laos or something, and you get it to a container port in China and packaged together in these large containers, comes across to LA Long Beach, shipped across countries, and you're buying it at Macy's and downtown San Francisco, the cost of that per unit is less than the cost of moving it by truck from let's say Southern San Fran up into downtown San Francisco. It, it is so cheap to move things by container ship in vast bulk that distance becomes a non-factor. Uh, and so if you're, if you're a growing economy like China with a low cost uh, labor force, the fact that you're trying to sell things a world away it, it is er, er, erased as a factor. And so this bulk shipping allows China to enter globalization and grow and grow and grow and grow. Okay, why does this matter? It matters because it begins to change China's relationship to the world, both in economic terms and in strategic terms. So think about this, you're uh, you know, the Chinese leadership, you're sitting inside your gilded offices in, in central Beijing, and you're looking out at the world and you've got the port uh, south of, of Beijing fronting out to the, to the LC, you've got a major port in Shanghai fronting out to the East China Sea, and you've got your ports around Hong Kong, fronting out to the South China Sea. Those are your, you know, those are your economic um, avenues out into the world. Most of your economy happens through those ports and out into those waters. You're, it's the, it's not just the lifeblood, it's, it's, the, it's the jugular vein of the Chinese economy is those sea base flows into those waters. But who controls those waters? The US Navy does. And so if you're China and you're a rising power and you're dependent on this trade in the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s, you begin to get quite uncomfortable with the notion that your trade, your economy is so dependent on the security provided by the US Navy. Now, one way to think about it is, hey, all they have to do is trust us and we carry the cost of securing global trade. And as long as they trusted us, they could just free ride on that. And for a while, that was the way they thought about it. But over time, they began to get more and more uncomfortable with that arrangement. And you begin to see a major shift in Chinese strategic thinking. If you go back to the 1940s and the period after the communist takeover uh, and the kind of Mao Zedong becomes the, the premier of China, the installation of the Communist Party in China. Um, if you go back to their strategic thinking then, they have a concept that they call deep inland defense. Okay. They're worried about what they call the near enemy, which is the Soviets in the north, and the far enemy, which is us. Uh, and they have a long history of being invaded by the British, by us, by other powers along their coastline. And their concept in the 40s and the 50s is, well, we can't fight them at the coastline, but we can draw them inland the way that Mao did during the Long March and sort of force the invader to come and exhaust themselves as they chase us across uh, the stretches of China. And this notion of deep inland defense was the core strategic concept that the Chinese used. As they sort of consolidated and became a little bit more confident in the 60s and the 70s after the Cultural Revolution, they began to think, well, actually, we could probably stop an invasion at the coast. And so they shifted their strategic concept to what they called coastal defense, which is exactly what it sounds like. You know, we'll have enough fortifications and enough capacity to stop an invasion at the coast. And for a long time, that was the core Chinese strategic concept. But as they began to experience the world of globalization and they watching their economy grow and grow and grow, and it's all dependent on these flows of containers and oil and gas and raw materials up through these waterways, they begin to think, well, we need a new concept. We need to be able to defend our interests uh, at sea. 
and in particular in what they call the near seas, the Yellow Sea, uh, the, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea. And they developed this concept of near seas defense. And I'll just show you a couple maps quickly here. We're obviously talking about the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's Hawaii in the middle. We're really talking about the Western Pacific. That's sort of, you can see China's Eastern coast and its um, access points out into the wider uh, pathways. Uh, and this is a close up on China's coastline. And, and what's striking for them, if you think about this in these terms is, if you look at any of their major economic centers on their East Coast, it's encircled by US allies and US bases, okay? And they become increasingly nervous and concerned about that. And they begin to worry about projecting power into these near seas, the seas just off China's Eastern coast. And by, by American allies, you mean Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, now nominally Vietnam, et cetera. That's what you mean by Correct. that? Correct. Yep. And, and American. And farther out, Australia. Okay. Farther out, Australia. And of course, then you have American bases in Guam, and then you have Hawaii. And so there's a kind of whole series of lines of American fortification all along the places that China would sail out to do its, its trade. Uh, China refers to that first suite of allies as the first island chain connecting the South Korean Peninsula to Japan. Japan has a whole series of islands that connect it to Taiwan. Taiwan's not an ally, but it's a close American defense partner, strategic partner. We have bases in the Philippines and then all the way down to Singapore where we have a base as well. We don't call it a base. It's quote a logistics facility, but you know, we keep naval ships there. So it's a base by any other, by any other terms. And so China begins to project power out into this, uh, into these near seas. Now, so the United States is watching this in the early 2000s as, as China is beginning to develop, the, to modernize its Navy, beginning to project, project power out into the near seas. And the United States is watching this and thinking, well, okay, we've been the dominant power. We are the power that guarantees the sea lanes of communications through these waters. What happens if China tries to choke them off? And at the time, I would have arguments with the folks in the Navy saying, look, China's not going to choke off that trade. It's literally the jugular of their economy. They can't afford to choke it off. That's not what you need to worry about. And in truth, that, that sentiment took hold eventually. That, that's not really the concern. China's not going to choke off the trade in the near seas. And at the same time, China began participating in international coalitions to, to tackle piracy. So in the early 2000s, as this huge expansion in sea-based trade had, had come to pass, we also saw a return to the world's second oldest profession, which is piracy. And you saw this huge uptick in piracy in the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Straits. And of course, the United States, the world's dominant Navy, had the primary role in tackling this, but recruited in a lot of allies and a lot of partners. And the Chinese participated in that. And the Chinese were sending ships out to the Indian Ocean, patrolling with us to counter piracy. And so for a brief moment, there was a sense of, well, perhaps this huge Chinese interest in globalization and our interest in globalization will be sufficient to allow the Chinese Navy and the American Navy to sort of coexist uh, and to co-manage some of these contested waters like the South and the East China Sea. But that didn't last very long and it began to break down and it began to break down around the time of the global financial crisis when I think China began to see weakness and vulnerability in the United States and some opportunities in challenging us. And China made a major move in, uh, in those near seas. It, it issued a claim under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for a huge swath of territory in the South China Sea, what a lot of its uh, maritime neighbors called the cow's tongue or the nine dash line, this vast claim to sovereign rights in the South China Sea and began to develop oil plays and natural gas plays and fishing plays in those waters, as well as consolidating naval power there. And it began to deepen concerns in the United States that China might not be limiting its ambitions to simply protecting trade. And over time, that concern grew and grew and grew. And in China, what we saw then was a change in their strategic concept from the notion of defense of the near seas to the notion of projecting power to the far seas, by which they're referring to the Arctic, the farther reaches of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and now farther out into the Atlantic and the Southern Ocean. And China begins to lay the foundation in shipbuilding in satellite technology and communications technology of a variety of types to project power out beyond the near seas and to develop the infrastructure of a global blue water Navy. 
And you begin to watch then the deep American concern about what that might mean. I spent some time uh, uh, for the book. I went out to Hawaii, which is sort of once again, the front lines of our naval contestation against a rising Asian power and spent time with Indo-Pacific Command and, and on a ship, the US John Paul Jones, which is one of the most advanced uh, destroyers in our fleet to understand how we were thinking about and reacting to this growing Chinese power. And what you see is this a, a deep, uh, a deep tension between the two countries emerge out of this Chinese, growing Chinese ambition to reach out to the Farsis. And it, it reminded me of an important historical episode in the, in the early 1900s. There's a British diplomat called Sir Eyre Crow, and he's asked by the Foreign Office to assess German naval power. Germany at the time is beginning to expand its naval power. What year are we talking now? This is, uh, I think, 1905, 1906 that he's, he's doing his work. And he has a, a German cousin and his wife is German and he spent time in Germany. So he, he counts as a, an expert on German affairs in the foreign office of the day. Uh, and he does this study and he writes it up. It's called the Crow Memorandum. And he says, look, Germany is a growing commercial power. Uh, the most important purpose of naval power is to protect commerce. As they grow their commercial power, it's natural that they would grow their naval power. And they say it's purely for defensive purposes and they may well be right. But can we trust them? Can we <laughs> trust that that won't change? Can we trust that their ambition won't change once they accomplish that naval power? And what I've seen over the past decade or so is that exact evolution in American strategic thinking about Chinese power. At first blush, their most important purpose of developing this Navy is to protect the flow of trade in these near seas. Even as they expand out to the far seas, there's a, a good reason for them to do that in terms of their interests in globalization, their interests in, in global trade. But can we trust? Do we really believe that that's gonna be the, the limits of their ambition or might they develop a wider appetite uh, to project power globally, at which point we're gonna to want to contain and constrain them. And what that triggered was indeed, uh, to your opening comment, Ron, a, a naval arms race. And that naval arms race is now well and truly underway in the Western Pacific. And what I try to emphasize in the book is that when I, when I use the term naval arms race, or when people use the term naval arms race, somehow I think it conveys in our imaginations, it's like we're reading Patrick O'Brien and there's a British ship of the line and a French ship of the line someplace in the off the coast of Mauritius and they're exchanging cannon fire. And you know, no, uh, that is not the way modern naval warfare works. Uh, modern naval ships are extraordinarily sophisticated pieces of technology. They are essentially floating sensors. They are collecting uh, satellite data and radar data linked into a huge global network of satellites and land-based radar stations, collecting information about the Chinese fleet China is in turn collecting that data on us. All of that is linked to missile systems, land-based and sea-based missile systems. China has been building out those missile systems. Uh, part of what it did in the near seas eventually, having started with energy plays and gas plays and fishing plays, it eventually built, uh, sort of took, took some small um, land features in those waters and built them out using land rec reclamation. And having promised the United States it would not do this, it then put military assets on those land features. A colleague of mine at Brookings calls them float, uh, stationary aircraft carriers. There are sort of air bases on there now. There are missile stations on there now. And that extends outwards the range of Chinese missiles farther out into the Western Pacific. And at the same time, we've been deepening our concepts of integrating space, naval, and missile warfare. The Chinese call this informatized war. We call it systems warfare. I think those phrases convey something of both the technological sophistication of what we're talking about and the scale of what we're talking about. If we end up in a naval clash with the Chinese in the Western Pacific, this is not gonna be two boats exchanging cannon fire. This is gonna be large scale systems warfare uh, involving missile strikes by us uh, on the Chinese mainland, their efforts to shoot our uh, shoot down our destroyers, attacks on American bases in, in Japan and elsewhere. Uh, this is large scale warfare between the two largest country, uh, the two largest armies in the world, two largest military forces in the world. Is China now bigger than Russia in military terms? Yeah, by far. They, they are. 
like so what's the rel- what's the relative size of um, our military and China's military and Russia's at this point? Yeah, okay. Uh, between the two largest military powers in the world, China is now a clear number two in defense spending. They now have more surface uh, warfare ships than we do. They're roughly two times the size of the Russian military in terms of, of capability, about four times their size in terms of naval capability. And most worrying to American strategic planners, their missiles are better than ours. Uh, they are better targeted. Um, they have technologies that we do not yet have in terms of their ability to use land-based uh, missiles to hit our ships, uh, sink our aircraft carriers, uh, and et cetera. We still have some key assets. Our submarine fleet is still substantially more sophisticated than the Chinese. They are catching up. Um, They now have four nuclear-powered submarines that are also nuclear launch capable. We have uh, a much greater number than that. All of our submarines are nuclear-powered. They're much more sophisticated, much more quiet than the Chinese submarine fleet. But that's the state of play. We are into a world in which we are uh, in, in a very intense arms race with the Chinese fleet. The Russians have moved a substantial portion of their fleet into the Pacific and out of their bases in the Arctic. It's not nearly as, as powerful as the Chinese, but it still has its, its strengths, especially in the submarine space. Japan has a very powerful Navy. We think of Japan as a sort of a pacifist power, but it's not when it comes to self-defense against China. And it has a very powerful Navy, which it's currently unshackling. Uh, And India uh, is building naval ships and aircraft carriers at a pace not quite as fast as as China, but pretty fast as well. And so what we're watching is all the major powers in the world uh, start to pour naval resources and technological resources into the Western Pacific to try to respond to or amplify or contain Chinese power. Britain, uh, for the first time in a couple of decades, has been able to sail an aircraft carrier. They have two of them now, their first trip was precisely to these waters uh, through the Luzon Strait uh, into the South China Sea to demonstrate uh, European presence in those waters. Every major power in the world now uh, is playing in this arms race, very dangerous arms race in my view, in the Western Pacific. Uh, And it entangles uh, our security, it entangles uh, nuclear weapons. We have nuclear submarine uh, barrages at play. We have a whole host of of military technologies at play. Two days after I published the book, the book ends with a call for what I describe as a new naval and technological alliance in the Western Pacific. Two days after I published the book, uh, President Biden and um, Morrison and Johnson announced the AUK-US deal, the Australia-UK-US deal to share nuclear submarine technology, the crown jewels of US military technology, as well as quantum AI, uh, cyber and undersea detection uh, technologies. To me, it was, it's the beginning of that naval and technological alliance in the Western Pacific. There's now been a new uh, agreement between the US, the UK, and Japan for naval sharing. Um, the launch of what's called the Quad, the US, the UK, India, um, and, and Australia, um, I'm sorry, and Japan engaged in high-level diplomacy and um, co-patrolling, um, co-exercising in, in our navies all in the Western Pacific. So the Western Pacific has really emerged as the new front lines of the quote unquote Cold War with China. I don't actually think Cold War is the correct term for what's going on between the United States and China, but it's shorthand, uh, the kind of geostrategic tensions between ourselves, China and the other major powers are centered on maritime power in the Western Pacific. And if just, Cold War is not a good term, what would be a good term? Yeah, I have to think hard about that one. I don't have a good term at, at hand, but I. Um, Uh, It is an arms race, to be sure. The reason I don't think Cold War is quite the right term is because you don't have, as you did during the Cold War, this this phenomenon of two absolutely dominant powers with essentially vassals underneath them. That's just not true of the modern situation. Europe is a much more powerful actor now than it was during the Cold War. Russia is a relatively powerful actor sort of within the Chinese sphere. India, Japan, these are these are puissant actors in world affairs. They're not just vassals of, of the United States or of China. So it's a more complicated landscape than the phrase Cold War, uh, I think, uh, I think allows. Um, but that's the state of affairs. We are in a race, uh, in a naval race. Uh, China is the dominant uh, maritime trading power. 
we are the dominant naval power still, but China's catching up. Um, and it means that huge parts of our security and our economy are torqued around the beam of sea-based trade and of, of maritime competition. In the book, I spent a bunch of time also talking about the way maritime dynamics have changed the global energy trade, the ocean sciences and climate change. So we can leave that on the, on the table for now. The key takeaway for me is the way in which sea power has returned to be the central uh, domain of competition between the world's top powers. How does America become more valuable to China so that they want us to succeed more? Well, I think that was really the concept in the 2000s, right? And they were dependent on our growth because our growth was their growth. We were the dominant power in globalization. They were dependent on globalization. I think what really began to dent that was the global financial crisis. They watched Wall Street and they watched Washington deal with the global financial crisis and thought, why are we trusting our future for these guys? Uh, and that really began the shift in Chinese sense that they couldn't rely on American power. In 2008, uh, that global crisis. 2007, 2008, 2009, the global financial right. crisis. Then, right. yeah, really right. dented their confidence. The United States was going to be able to handle uh, global affairs and would accommodate their rise within, within, this, within our sort of our managed globalization. Um, so I think, unfortunately, that that notion that they they want us to succeed because they'll succeed, that was true. I don't think it is anymore. I think they now see themselves as in a race for dominance with us. And so we were their customer. They wanted us to succeed when we were their principal customer. But as their domestic markets eclipse our, uh, you know, the export markets to us, they can become more and more self-sustaining. Is that also the case? Over time, it is. Over time, it is. Um, they still have to work out some pretty important issues like their reliance on the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, the dollar is still the dominant currency in the world, and almost all Chinese trade is denominated in the dollar. That's a big vulnerability for them. It's one of the reasons why they liberalized their financial sector. They recognize that if they, uh, if they more fully liberalize, if they started to do, um, they can. Uh, increase the extent to which their trade is dominated, dominated in the yuan and and. and and limit our capacity to use financial sanctions to hurt them because it would be so hurtful to us. So for right now, they're in this kind of complicated space where they want to challenge us strategically in the Western Pacific and the naval domain and the technological domain. Their economy is still heavily dependent on trade with the West, so they can't go too far, or at least you know we hope that that's a constraint as it is on us. Uh, yet the tensions are mounting. We, we didn't talk about the fact that within that first island chain, there's also Taiwan. Taiwan is very consequential in, in the thinking of Xi Jinping. I think most people who uh, follow events in China believe that she will ultimately try to reabsorb Taiwan into, uh, into sovereign Chinese territory, if necessary, uh, by naval means. Um, and, and so the tensions are rising. Um, we see it in the in the way that we've approached China over the last little while, and we see it in this naval arms race. So now earlier, I asked a comparison of the military size of China versus the United States and or potentially Russia, but actually a more accurate um, comparison might be Western powers, because we aren't just alone. And one of the strengths of American military might since World War II have been the pyramid of alliances we formed uh, alongside us or basically under our control, uh, meaning uh, all the Western forces as well, uh, including Australia recently and Japan and uh, Europe. So talk to us now about the relative size of Western forces. And, and is that a reasonable measure to compare China's strength? Yeah, I, I think it is. And it's why I said that I entered the book by arguing for a new sort of a new configuration of the alliances with the orientation around naval and, and technological. Japan's Navy, uh, we talked about matters a lot and have a very sophisticated submarine fleet. Uh, Australia is, you know, tiny in relative terms, but locationally very useful, right? It's very right. helpful. We're going to try to contain Chinese power to have bases at the southern end of that of that set of, of that set of waters. Um, our bases in the Philippines or our basing rights in the Philippines to be more precise, our, our base in Singapore, all these matter. Um, in real terms, though, if you're thinking about the technological, the high technological end of this fight, it's us and the Japanese. 
Uh, it would be nice politically to say that the Europeans matter to this again. Um, you know, the British decision to sail their two aircraft carriers, Germany sent a frigate out there. France obviously wanted into the Australia nuclear submarine space. In truth, it's a modest contribution that they could make. And that's even if they don't have to worry about anything in the European context. And as course, as we're watching in real time, they do have to worry about things in the European context. Russia hasn't gone away, uh, threatening the Baltics, threatening Ukraine. Uh, Europe does not have enough military capacity to simultaneously handle Russia and contribute to security in, in Asia. So we're really talking about the United States and Japan in terms of major military powers, unless India, really deepens its naval capacity, which it wants to do. It remains to be seen how quickly it can do that. That's a real game changer. If India can develop a genuinely powerful Navy, uh, in the book, I describe the Indian subcontinent as a thousand mile dagger in the heart of China's Indian Ocean ambitions. You know, if you sail past the American Navy in Singapore and out through the Malacca Strait and into the Indian Ocean, the first thing you encounter is Indian bases in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and so as India, which has never been a, a major naval power, never in its history, but if India can develop as a major naval power, that will be a major constraint for China. And this is why I think the quad that I referenced earlier is so important. Okay, talk a little bit about Japan. Since MacArthur signed the armistice on the Missouri in Japan at the conclusion of our Pacific battles in World War II, uh, Japan originally had a treaty that was a, sort of a, a de-armament treaty where they would demilitarize. But of late, uh, that it, that's changing. Talk a little bit about the evolution of military capacity in Japan. Yeah, I think a really important thing to understand is that even under their um, post-war constitution, which limited their ability to engage in, in military activity, there was always an exception for self-defense. They've always had the constitutional provisions to allow themselves to engage in self-defense, okay? And so it's, it's not uh, irrelevant that the Japanese Navy is actually called the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces, all right? What are they defending themselves against? China. All right, then their strategic worldview, the major threat to their security comes from China. Uh, and so there is nothing in their constitutional provisions that stop them from engaging in military actions to defend themselves against Chinese power. All right. And what they've done over the last several years is clarify some really important parts of that, like the fact that they are authorized to shoot down missiles. Uh, that aren't necessarily aimed at directly at Japan, but might be aimed at a US at a Japanese ally like the United States, they could engage in self-defense activity to intercept or shoot down such a missile. And most important recently, they've clarified that given the strategic consequences of it, a Chinese attack on Taiwan would be something that the Japanese would respond to as part of their self-defense doctrine. So when I use the phrase unshackling their naval power, that's what I'm referring to. They're kind of changing the political terms to say, actually, we would be able to, we willing and able to use the powerful Navy that we do have to respond to China, both in terms of attacks on the United States uh, in the Western Pacific and, and specifically on Taiwan. That's a big change. Um, and the giant Japanese Navy is a powerful Navy. Talk to us and show us with your cursor, I see your cursor moving around. Show us about the island development where they're taking little bits of land and, and building them into stationary right. aircraft carriers. That's happening here. Okay, this is sort of a triangle here. These are all land features with wonderful names. There is a mischief reef and fiery reef and <laughs> uh, the Scarborough Shoals. It's all in this space here. Uh, and they have several purposes for it. Okay, they their first purpose is they claim it extends their continental shelf in terms of economic claims under the law of the sea. So they're putting in um, energy and uh, sort of oil and gas plays around here and around here. But even more important in my view, they've begun to militarize those features. Okay, so they're, they've done huge land reclamation. Uh, there are air bases on those features now. There are missile stations on those features. There are similar things happening up here um, in what the uh, Japanese call the Senkakus and the Chinese called the Daiwu Islands. Um, that's a zone of important contestation. Uh, but it's here that they've done these land reclamations. And that extends Chinese missile range by, in some cases, as much as a thousand miles, which is quite a lot, right? Because if you have to station your missiles here, 
then your range is extended of the of the first generation of their missiles is extending only out to here. If you can put your missiles here, then your range comes quite a bit farther out. And so their ability to stop our navy from reinforcing our position in these waters, uh, those those land features are important. Now they're a little less important than they used to be in the, because China's missile technology is so sophisticated. China now has missiles capable of hitting our aircraft carriers way out to this second island chain, which is which is Guam. Uh, and that's begun to cause the United States to think hard about whether, whether it is still the case that we can safely project naval power out into these waters, or whether we're simply making our aircraft carriers extremely vulnerable to Chinese missiles in that, in that scenario. And whether our bases and our naval installations in these islands here are now too vulnerable to those to those missiles. Um, that's again where the submarine fleet is so important. Uh, once launched, China can't really detect our submarine fleet. So we could flood submarines in through this Luzon Strait into these waters without them really being able to detect those movements. Uh, and that's a major threat to them. So now North Korea, uh, talk a little bit about North Korea as a pawn in the Chinese uh, expression of power and extension of power and how it how it relates to our, our good ally, South Korea. Yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated place because, of course, North Korea is at one and the same time sort of under the thumb of the Chinese, but doesn't much like that position. Um, and it sort of we goes wing, yin and yang is between sort of maintaining the kind of coverage of the big brother in, in Beijing and actually wanting to get a little space. And part of why they are often interested in strategic negotiations with the United States is actually to kind of get a little space between themselves and Beijing. But push comes to shove, it, it's Beijing that provides their core to core security guarantees. Um, an important issue is that some of our missile technology is at first blush designed to shoot down North Korean missiles. Uh, that a lot of what we have developed in anti-ballistic missile technology, its first concern was North Korean missiles. Um, now we're more preoccupied about Chinese missiles. Um, I spent some time on the, this ship, which is the USS John Paul Jones. It's the most advanced uh, Aegis class ballistic missile destroyer in the United States. It is the first ship that has successfully shot down uh, a ballistic missile from sea. So, so China launches a ballistic missile against us, this ship and, and now a couple others like it can actually shoot down that missile successfully. The problem with that is we only have a handful of these ships. They can hold at most about 45 anti-ballistic missiles at a time. Um, China could simply rain down hundreds of these, uh, sort of hundreds of dummy missiles against us, exhaust our defenses. Uh, and then it used its more strategic missiles. So um, anti-ballistic missile defense has been a major focus of American strategy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And there's a big question whether it's actually an adequate defense against the Chinese missile systems. So if you were a pessimist and you wanted to draw the arc of their um, sort of military domination, what are the dominoes? Do they take Taiwan? What do they do in sequence? The Chinese. It's surprisingly hard to take Taiwan um, in real terms. Okay, it's 23 million people with very sophisticated weaponry, most of it provided by us, some of it by France. Uh, mounting a sea based invasion of a well defended island is historically a very hard thing to do. Um, it might be what they try first. I'm not so sure. Um, what we're watching is they are simply deepening their global exposure okay they have the they've opened they opened their first naval base in Djibouti Wait, you say they mean uh, sorry, China yeah okay fronting the Indian Ocean at the entrance to the Red Sea uh, they opened their first naval base there in 2019 they've just reached an agreement to open a naval base in Equatorial Guinea on the kind of western coast of Africa fronting onto the Atlantic they're building these strategic strong points uh, in ports across the world. And essentially it seems to me what they are doing is positioning themselves the way the British did in the 1800s, the way we've done in the post-war period to be a power in globalization, to be a power that can exert influence through global naval uh, capacity on the patterns of trade and on the politics that attach to us. I don't think that their ambition is as much territorial 
as it is to exert that kind of global influence. Taiwan may be a very important exception of that. But the worry is not uh, them invading Japan or them invading you know, the, the South Korea. That's not the worry. The worry is their capacity, the same way we did, the same way the British did, to use global naval power as a source of political and commercial influence. That's, I think, where the concern really lies. I asked earlier about the Panama Canal. It's less and less important um, in these terms because the South China Sea has so much more traffic than the Panama Canal. But um, if effectively China closed the Panama Canal for some reason, which is a drastic step, how would that change our military um, capabilities to have an actual war with them? The Panama Canal? Yes. Yeah, right now they don't have the capacity to do that. Uh, they could mine it, but we could, you know, we have, we and our allies have anti-mining capability to, to clear those mines. Um, the, what they are beginning to have is the capacity to close the um, Malacca Straits. I mean, that's still pretty hard for them to do because we still got some capacity there, but essentially what they would have to do is move substantial naval assets down through the South China Sea. This is the Malacca Strait here. Uh -huh. You know, and they could set up a cordon here to stop shipping through these straits. We can uh -huh. do that as well. And one of the things that um, we're all engaged in is sort of intensive naval planning for what a what a blockade looks like in these waters. Do we win that? Do they win that? Um, if that escalates into them starting to take out, you know, we have ships in Japan, we have ships out here, ships in Guam. They start to move to take that stuff out. We then moved to take out their missile installations, which are about a thousand miles inland. Now we're at full scale war with the Chinese army, right? This is where I said before, this stuff escalates real quick. This is not uh, an isolated ship, you know, shooting at each other in, in some place in the Western Pacific. This is large scale systems warfare between the two most powerful uh, militaries in the world. And a, a naval blockade to stop, you know, to kind of choke Taiwan is, is a real scenario. Um, if they believe that we were uh, behaving in ways that fundamentally threatened them, they might try to engage in a blockade of the Malacca Straits. They're very worried that we will engage in a blockade of the Malacca Straits. That's a big part of their strategic planning. So these waters are, uh, you know, contested and very tense. This right here is the Luzon Strait. It's how you come in from the Western Pacific into these waters. It's the deepest submarine channel. I describe it in the book as playing the same role that uh, the Fool of the Pass in East Germany played during the Cold War. This is the most important place where large scale military clashes would occur, mostly submarines and, and surface shipping. If World War III breaks out, it's likely to be in that little piece of water right there. That's exactly what I was getting to. Okay, show us where Hong Kong is, put your cursor up where Hong, yeah, Hong Kong is sort of someplace around here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so essentially, the combination of those straits and the Malacca Straits are the sort of tinder boxes of where there could be lots of um, activity, is what you're saying, military activity. Yeah, this is the Taiwan Strait. If they decide to go for Taiwan, that's going to be the flashpoint. If it's a broader sense of uh, trying to preempt us um, from reinforcing our positions, this body here, the Luzon Strait, is the more likely flashpoint. This is where you know, this is the most important waterway in the world in terms of trade, the Malacca Strait. 50% of the global economy passes through those waters. Um, and so if we were getting into really complicated, long-standing long warfare and blockades and stuff, it would be these waters down here. This is Singapore right at that tip. So, so the Malacca Strait, you said 50% of the world's trade. Um, so that's the trade which is not going across to LA, across the Pacific. That's the traffic which is going to Europe, essentially. The Europe Malacca and New York. Europe and New York. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Europe and the East, East Coast. Coast. Yeah. Right. East Coast. Okay. So now, um, when in 1998 or 99, when Hong Kong reverted away from the British to its gradual Chinese, what, what, what would we call it? It stops being a British protectorate and uh, they make an agreement, the Chinese make an agreement, which they've now broken uh, to leave it be independent. Talk to us about Taiwan in those terms. What's the way that China comes to influence dominate Taiwan? Yeah, so I think it's a very important connection to make because for a long period of time, um, it was assumed that the major, the dominant strategy that China would pursue for Taiwan would be a political strategy, okay? That they would say to the Taiwanese, 
you know, one country, two systems, you can maintain some independence, you can still have an army, but you're gonna recognize Chinese sovereignty and you sort of be part of the part of the broader fold. Uh, and they would exert influence to accomplish that through gray zone tactics, disinformation campaigns, political pressure, economic pressure, a variety of non-military means. Okay. But when they launched the crackdown in Hong Kong in the last couple of years, you know, it passed a new national security law that changed the balance of power between the Hong Kong authorities and the Chinese authorities, uh, killed a lot of, killed or arrested a lot of the kind of leaders of the opposition, really sort of clamped down on any kind of political opposition inside Hong Kong. That essentially erased the notion that there was gonna be any kind of strategy that in, in any kind of political strategy that would lead to a one country, two systems arrangement with Taiwan. Um, and you saw it in Taiwan, in voting patterns, in uh, opinion polling, it, it really closed down the sense that there was any possibility of a, an eventual political settlement with Taiwan, uh, with China. I mean, that in my mind makes it more likely over time that we will see Xi Jinping make a military move on Taiwan. That could be a blockade in the first instance designed to kind of pressure them into capitulation, or it could be a larger uh, military move, notwithstanding the complexities of that. The essential question then is, do we come to Taiwan's aid? We're not treaty bound to do so, uh, but they are a close friend. They're not an ally, but they're a close friend. They're a crucially important technological partner. 50% of the world's supply of high-end uh, computer chips comes from Taiwan. Uh, and they've been a long-standing defense partner. And uh, it's a very important strategic question because if China takes Taiwan and they can put their ships here, then they can access the Western Pacific uh, outside of this first line of defenses. These are the Japanese islands here. If you have a Chinese port here, they can sort of pressure Japan without having to worry about that first line of defense or our defenses around here. So a Chinese naval base on the Eastern shore of Taiwan really changes the game in terms of their capacity to threaten our interests out towards uh, Guam and, and Hawaii. So there are a whole host of reasons why we might well come to Taiwan's defense. Um, but again, it's a scenario which escalates very rapidly into missile strikes on Japan, missile strikes on China, um, loss of aircraft carrier, lots of large portions of our fleet, really large scale warfare in that scenario. With, potential risks of nuclear escalation. So give us a, give us another inventory of the U.S. and Japanese military uh, compared to the Chinese. Yeah, so the U.S. Navy will say now that China's Navy is larger than ours. That's true if you count uh, combat-ready surface vehicles. Um, I don't think that's quite the right measure because we still have much larger ships. We have much more tonnage, much more missile capacity than they do. But if you're thinking about a Taiwan scenario or a Luzon Strait scenario, they're fighting within a couple hundred miles of their coast. We're fighting 6,000 miles away from San Diego and 3,000 miles away from Hawaii. So they have some pretty important geographical advantages, which is why Japan's Navy is so important. And they have uh, the, the third largest Navy in the world, um, about 45,000 naval personnel and arguably the second largest and second most sophisticated submarine fleet, a lot of it arrayed along this um, string of islands that comes down as far as, as Taiwan. So this is crucially important in the Japanese Navy here, as well as our naval assets uh, in Japan. We have a aircraft carrier, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier permanently home ported in Japan. It's the only time in history that an aircraft carrier has been home ported in a country other than the country that owns it in the first instance. We have a nuclear aircraft carrier in Japan, the Reagan, uh, and all the ships that surround that. And so those two things together, I would argue, are uh, still more powerful than the Chinese Navy, but Chinese missile technology is, is rapidly uh, balancing that equation. Bruce, what a fascinating talk. Thank you very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. I really appreciate your invitation. It's been a pleasure chatting to you, and I hope to see you in person in the not too distant future. And you can Perfect. take it for a sale. Be happy to take you for a sale. With that, we adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.